welcome to St. Peter's on this, the Festival of All Saints. We're delighted that you are here. We are surrounded by God's saints and uh, we celebrate their light and their victory. Our service begins on page 323 of the Red Prayer Book. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord. Lord be with you. And the collect for this day is the celebration of the saints. Let us pray. Almighty God, with whom still live the spirits of those who die in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and felicity, we give you heartfelt thanks for the good example of all your saints and servants, who having finished their course in faith, now find rest and refreshment. May we, with all who have died in the true faith of your holy name, have perfect fulfillment and bliss in your eternal and everlasting glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judea went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Emiliac, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mylon and Chilion. They were Ephrates from Bethlehem in Judea. They went into the country of Moab, and remained there. But Emiliac, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard 
in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the land of the Lord has turned against me. Then she wept loudly again. Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There, I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of the Lord.
to the insert in the middle of your uh, in the middle of the program. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 146, and we will read it antiphonally to the star. Alleluia! Praise the Lord, O my soul. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth. For there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth. And in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help. Whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them. Who peace is promised forever. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed. And to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and the widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God is Zion. This reading is from Hebrews. When Christ came as a high priest of all the good things that have come, even though the greater and perfect tent, not made with his hands, that is, not of his creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that the flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the internal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscious, conscience from dead works to worship the living God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I invite the congregation to stand for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of the living God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, amen. amen. I wonder what it is that draws and attracts us to particular people that we might dare to call saints. The term has meant different things to different communities over the centuries. But if we go back to the original Greek word, the word holy, the word saint means holy or set apart. And we have in the Acts of the Apostles, Simon says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man who much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And by saints, he meant the set apart people. And here, saints refers 
to all the Christians in Jerusalem, not just one special group of Christians. And in the New Testament, the word saint or saints is used 67 times. And in every instance, it refers to all believers. We see that in Romans, in Corinthians, in Acts. Never is the word used of a special group of believers who serve God better than the rest of us. So scripture is clear that that all Christians are saints. And in Ephesians, Paul teaches that the spiritual gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So clearly the saints are ordinary Christians involved in the service of the church and in the world. And over the, you know, for the first 1400 years of the history of the church, the tradition of the saints was very much a raising up of local heroes and sheroes, people who lived ordinary lives who were somehow different or kind of a cut above the rest of us. And they were often canonized by the church and, and there was this kind of fascination not only with their lives, but it was said that they possessed um, miraculous gifts of healing that would continue after their life. And so the, uh, the bodies of departed saints and the clothing and objects that were associated with them also uh, for us possessed enormous um, power and mystery. And you had this whole tradition of the, uh, the preservation of relics and uh, parts of that person who were venerated by the faithful. And this, is, this comes to a height in the medieval church. And it's, it's a funny, you know, those of us from Northern uh, Europe or the Northern Hemisphere, we don't understand this fascinating that Italians have about uh, bones and relics of saints. If you go to Rome, you know, some of us are a little, it's a little macabre, this kind of bits and pieces of people's fingers and toes and, and tibia that um, are somehow venerated in glass cases and so on. But if we, look at, if we look at the tradition around the festival of all saints, it was very interesting that it was in the seventh century that one of the popes, um, it was Pope Boniface, um, took a very famous uh, pagan temple, the, the Pantheon in Rome. And the way that he consecrated it to, uh, the, to become a church was that he took 28 cartloads of these bits of the saints from the catacombs of Rome, and he put them under the high altar. And many of them were martyrs. Many of them had suffered courageously for their faith. But the way in which the kind of the festival of all saints uh, began with that, that tr tradition. And later, Pope Gregory moved that feast day from May to November the 1st. Um, so the church has been celebrate, uh, celebrating this holy day um, for many, many, many uh, centuries. Um, one of the most famous saints that I want to tell the story, because this gives you a, a glimpse of this fascination with relics, uh, St. Francis of Assisi. We recently celebrated uh, St. Francis Day and his love of creation. And um, he died in 1226 in Assisi, and he was a very humble man. And he was so humble, he said, just put me in the rubbish dump, the local rubbish tip. He didn't want to be venerated, and so on. But because Francis was so loved and so powerful that the church realized that they needed to get in on the act. So within two years of his death, he was canonized by the church. And he was so important that the basilica that was built um, had the same spiritual power as a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So what the Pope was saying is, this is a very special place to go and venerate the, the uh, sacred relics of St. Francis. And they built this great b b basilica uh, that was consecrated in 1230. Um, and it was unusual because usually the average um, lifespan of what it kind of took to do an investigation on St. Johnny Come Lately, a kind of in-depth background check, was about 180 years. So to canonize uh, Francis so quickly was, was unusual. 
Um, and their story goes that because the good people of Assisi, they were in rival with, uh, rivals with uh, people in Perugia who had better saints' bones, that they thought that they, the people of Assisi might hijack the funeral uh, cortege as his body was being moved to the basilica. So the coffin was, was empty, actually, because they had quietly put his body in the basilica a couple of days before. But it showed you the kind of hysteria that in the medieval period was around relics and the saints. And it was also big business that, that uh, the idea that you know, the, the Vatican cashed in, literally cashed in, on the death of, of Francis, and that local rulers and kings and popes would gain enormous wealth and power through the collection of these relics. And some of us have visited that wonderful uh, medieval confection in Paris, uh, Saint-Chapelle. Uh, it used to be part of the royal palace, not far from Notre Dame. And that beautiful building, that medieval building, was built as a reliquary for the the, um, the crown of thorns. And the crown of thorns was bought by King Louis for billions of francs. Uh, again, it was like early stock market trading. Um, and, and it was venerated there. And it, it is now, um, that rests in Notre Dame Cathedral and is used in Lent. But you get, again, the sense of the enormous uh, power of the saints and the relics that were, were associated with them. And that takes us right up to the Reformation because the selling of indulgences and the praying for the dead and the hoarding of these relics became one of the focal points of Martin Luther and the Reformation 500 years ago. And, and a lot of it centered around um, uh, prayers for the dead. And, and again, the tradition in those days was that you know a soul, when you died, um, you didn't go directly to heaven, you were in purgatory, and so you had to kind of get a mortgage to uh, pay for your wife's, for if you wanted to release her into heaven, that was. Um, you, would, you would pay the church to pray for her soul. And so you had, again, this kind of great corruption of what the tradition of the saints and what the love of God um, was all about. Even if we look at Martin Luther, his great supporter, Frederick the Wise, who lived in Wittenberg Castle, who was one of the German nobles who protected him, um, Frederick the Wise was kind of reluctant to give up this issue of indulgences and relics. And he owned 19,013 relics that he made a lot of money from. So it took him a couple of years to finally kind of let go of that and really embrace fully the teaching of the, the, Ref, the Reformation. Um, in Protestantism, we get to our own kind of period and how we feel about the saints and so on. And we, again, we take in a kind of via media. Um, there was containment of the previous exploitation and corruption of the saints by the church. And um, we, we, um, this is epitomized in some writings of Martin L Luther. This is what he says about praying for the dead. As for the dead, since scripture gives us no information on the subject, I regard it as no sin to pray with free devotion in this or some similar fashion. Dear God, if this soul is in a condition accessible to mercy, be thou gracious to it. And when this has been done once or twice, let it suffice. For vigils and requiem masses and yearly celebrations of requiems are useless and are merely the devil's annual fare. So there was this great kind of like cleansing. And a lot of it was violent. A lot of uh, the Reformation was about destroying beautiful works of art, uh, chantry chapels and statues and art to kind of purify, to kind of get back to a kind of more biblical view that we are all saints and that we, and they shouldn't be used in kind of trading uh, and so on and so on. So where are we today? And it's interesting that in our lifetime, the Roman Catholic Church has about 10,000 uh, officially recognized saints and there's a whole department that kind of looks into that. And as I said, it takes about used to take about 180 years. So you were long dead, but what was it about your life 
the quality of your life that was still kind of impact, impact in the world today. And that radically changed in our lifetime. And it was under the pontificate of Pope John, uh, John Paul II, right? And he was a very charismatic pope. He, he went, he started traveling. He, he built the church, particularly in the developing world. And what the church would do, and it was very smart, it would go into those local regions and again raise up people who were lights in darkness. And so in Africa and in South America, and, and in different parts of the world, um, saints, and something like 500 saints were canonized in John Paul II's pontificate, which again, no, ever, no pope has done that before. And, as, and that, that encouraged the faithful, the growth of the Roman Catholic Church in the global south was huge. And the, and the kind of raising up of the local saints and the things that they stood for was very much a part of that process. And even John Paul II, this was again unheard of, that he was canonized within a couple of years of his death. Pope Benedict uh, canonized uh, a pope that we all, we all connected with, we all knew in some way. Um, and so, so the Roman Catholic Church um, has kind of revolutionized the way that it thinks about saints in much the way that Anglicans have done. And how we look at it is we claim that biblical tradition that we are all saints. That is something that, again, that's part of our reformation. We are all the saints of God. And we also recognize that there are people in our lives and not too far away in the distant future who have been exceptional, that they have been lights in the darkness, that they have represented courage and justice and the love of God in a way that lives on beyond their generation. And I think we have a, we have a, a book in the Episcopal tradition, which is Holy Men and Holy Women. And, and we, we commemorate, we remember saints, we remember people who are exceptional uh, in the calendar. This week, for example, we will remember in the Anglican and the Episcopal calendar, we will remember um, uh, Archbishop uh, William Temple, who was one of the great archbishops during the Second World War. And we also remember people like Absalom Jones, who was the first African-American priest living in the 18th century in the Episcopal Church. And to bring you right up to date, some of the local clergy in this area, one of the things that we're looking at is how do we include someone like Eleanor Roosevelt in the, in the calendar of the church? And, and kind of our own little process of canonizing her for what she has done. And to do that, we need, it has to be uh, recommended by local diocesan convention, then it goes to general convention. And usually there is a prayer, a collect, and some readings that are associated with that person's life. It's voted on, and then it becomes part of this list. And there is a prayer that a local priest has already written about her. And I, again, I'm sharing a kind of process with you about how this one life that we connect with um, has transformed the world. Here's the collect. God of all compassion, father of all, you brought your daughter Eleanor Roosevelt into a world of privilege, yet gave her a keen understanding of pain, injustice, and suffering in the world. You brought her to a position of prominence as first lady of the United States but inspired her to work for the alleviation of these ills and to champion the unity of all humanity through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Fill us with a similar compassion and love for your children that we may see you in the eyes of all our neighbors near and far and that we too may work for justice and reconciliation throughout the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So that, that's kind of in the works. That's still, she's not officially in our calendar yet. But that's an example of how somebody who has remained constant through the ages that inspires us and gives us light in the darkness. I served in a church in Pasadena, and on this Sunday, every All Saints Tide, the rector, George Regis, would share an image that has stayed with me. And he said, you know, in our lives, there are people 
that have inspired us. They are people who have believed in us. There are people who loved us unconditionally, right? And some of them are still around and some of them are departed. And he said, he uses this image that they are on our balconies cheering us on. They're on our balconies cheering us on. That's a wonderful image of the communion of saints as we remember in our own lives uh, uh, and lives today. And so I'm gonna close with referring to this wonderful book. Um, Joan Chichester is a Roman Catholic nun. And what I love about this book is that through her con connections with relig religious order, um, this group of people worked on uh, 21 outstanding people, most of whom are Christians, but not all. One of, one of the people that she records is Rumi, who's a Sufi mystic. So saints don't have to be Christian. And the, um, she, she's worked with Robert Lentz, who's an icon writer. And you have these beautiful icons of what she calls um, fragments of the face of God. And uh, this is what she says. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure if we have this book in our library, but if not, I will give it. I will give it to... to there, there, here we go. Barbara? And I love the way she's married the kind of historical stuff of the saints that I've talked about with the contemporary world. And this is what she says. At the same time, an officially constructed canonization process separated the people in need of models from the very personalities and forces that had given spirit to their lives in the here and now. The canonization process looked for the heroic and the good separated the merely pious from the powerfully holy, wanted miracles as well as the proof of a good life to qualify a person for canonization, Consecrate, concentrated on professional religious figures to the prejudice of lay people, and men to the detriment of women, concentrated on ecclesiastical docility as a sign of holiness. It chances turning goodness into merely cardboard. It chances turning goodness into merely cardboard. It disqualifies for consideration people who fall in the course of rising to new human heights. It cuts holiness from a common cloth that it's theologically proper, the ecclesiastically docile, the morally safe. As a result, it eliminates from regard an entire body of people because of whom the very soul of the world has been stretched, but who may not be synch synchronous with the current ideas of the church, who may not even be Catholic, who might be without signs of flaw and struggle. It leads imperceptibly, but almost invariably, to a theology of disillusionment. <laughs> So what she's saying is that the canonization process is actually backfired and, isn't, is, is, and needs to be kind of renewed and reformed. And she talks about the selections in her book, figures gleaming in their holy causes who are awkward in their personal lives. They are sometimes in confusion as we are. They are virtuous beyond telling in one dimension and weak to the point of sin in others. At the same time, they hold a fire in their hearts, bright enough to light a way for many. They are impelled by the will of God for humankind, and they will brook no less. They stand on gilded stilts above the rest of their generation and become a sign for all generations. They are a proof of possibility from ages past and a symbol of hope for ages to come. And so with that wonderful kind of description, uh, we are surrounded by this inner circle of the saints of God in this congregation, the saints of God in our own personal lives, the people who are on our balconies, who cheer us on. And as we break bread at this table, we have a foretaste of that horizon, of that heavenly banquet where all of God's saints rest and bask in the glory and love of God. Amen. Amen.
So our service continues on page 326 as we share in the historic words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And so at this time, in place of the prayers of the people, we remember uh, the saints in our own lives, in the life of our community. And I invite Cecilia and Nastia uh, to join with us as we remember with thanksgiving. May, May Atri, Eleanor and William, Bill and Riley Baldwin, Dr. Stephen Balshi, Rosemary Bellhausen, Piero Blua, R. Morris Boyd, Helen Burkhart, Richard Cawthorn, Mary and Joe Doherty, Kit and Tom Favreau, Noel Ferris, Dot Wynn and Jack Fisher, Donald Frain, Anna Fusinetti, Charlie Gillis, Shirley Glazebrook, Marianne and Roderick Goh, Marta and Thurston Green, Peggy and Mara Hansen, Aurora Hitchcock, Amy Caliber, W. Scott Leonard, Constantine and Harriet Georgiopoulos, Jacqueline Long, Ruth Lean B. Luxmore, Tracy McTaggart, Theo Lander, Perdita Marston, Dwight Martin, William Clay Stannard McKinley, Malcolm Purcell McLean Jr., Mom and Dad, their sons and daughter, Bruce Moore, Irene Morrill, Phil Nolan, Lawrence Notable, Bill Orr, Elliot and Dodie Purse, Ibn and Hilda Pine, Tony Scarletta, D.B. and Mabel Schmidt, George Schmidt, Doreen Zippy, Jean Eric Shrubsole, Maud Smith, Ronald Smith, Leroy Swindell, Virginia Tozer, Ruth Sumner's Trampler, Margaret Wetmore, John Whitworth, Maxine Smith, Douglas Mercer Sr., Mary S. Babcock and John Babcock, Brewster Beach, Frederick Borsch, Karen Bontecu and Catherine Bontecu, Bettina Bucklin, Arnold Bukov, Mary Bergen, Fred and Sue Carter, George Fenn, Teresa and Clarence Garvey, Francis Godfrey, John Howley, Gwyn Habel, Anne and James Kissan, Anne Lafarge, Miriam and William Landis, Milton Michelle. Mary Neal and Eusis Olin, Albert, Thelma and Michael Olga, Ona Okath, D.B. Phillips, Elizabeth W. Phillips, Curtis Place, Louise Partial Pontefract, James no 
Rollins, Betty Rooney, Dennis Rooney, Cynthia St. Amand, Molly Schaefer, George Sims, Earl and Marguerite Shequin, Abbott Smith, Claire Tam, William Tarbox, Faith Tompkins, Fred Travasano, Sally Boulette, Carne Weeks, Fred West, Mary West, Nancy Rimley Whitley, Linda Wilson, Sally and Roger Young. And in a moment of silence, we commend to God those in our hearts and all our minds. Almighty God, we rejoice in the fellowship of the multitude of your saints, living and departed, who we honor today. May we run with patience the race that is set before us, and together with them receive the crown of glory that never fades. We give thanks for the love, courage, and teaching of our forebears and all whom we love but see no longer. We give thanks for the clergy and people of St. Peter's throughout the generations who have created this sacred space and thanks for their generosity, faithfulness, and vision. We give thanks for all we name this day in our necrology. Amen. 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 My brothers and sisters, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to be seated. So we are really delighted that you're here today. And uh, I just want to express my deep appreciation to uh, our musicians and choir and to Nancy for the special music today. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of very brief announcements. We will do a, uh, be doing an acolyte training again today at the end of the service. And we're beginning to um, start thinking about our pageant, our Christmas pa pageant. So some of the parents uh, will be meeting after coffee hour uh, to start to talk about that today and we will get back to you. And then one new addition to the St. Peter's uh, spiritual life. And I want Nastia, who's our associate for Christian education, to tell you about Instagram. So I'm continuing to shake things up a bit for St. Peter's. And so we now have an Instagram page, which is public and accessible to all. It's stpeters.lithgo. And there's some daily like questions, reflections, um, some art, some music. So if you're looking for something to s help you stay spiritually inspired throughout the week, um, I thought perhaps that could be one of the ways um, we could do so. Yeah, so sh send some likes, ideas. Uh, Thanks. So That's great. So everyone is welcome to communion today. If you're visiting St. Peter's for the first time, everybody's welcome at the table. Um, so the choir will be receiving communion first, and then we'll start at the back of the church and just uh, come up and um, receive communion or cross your arms, and I'll give you a blessing. Any other announcements? James. Anything else? So walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. And we now sing our offertory hymn, hymn 293, I sing a song of the saints of God.
Our service continues on page 340 of the Red Prayer Book, page 340. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for in the multitude of your saints, you have surrounded us with a great cloud of witnesses that we might rejoice in their fellowship and run with endurance the race that is set before us and together with them receive the crown of glory that never fades away. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, evermore praising thee and singing. stand or kneel or sit for the prayer of consecration on page 341. All glory be to thee, O Lord, our God, for that thou didst create heaven and earth and didst make us in thine own image, and of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made there a full and perfect sacrifice for the whole world, and it institutes, and in his holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to thee, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to thee, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, we thy people do celebrate and make with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again with power and great glory. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and with thy word and Holy Spirit to bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be unto us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, whereby we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies. Grant, we beseech thee, that all who partake of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and also that we and all thy whole church may be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So the prayer of humble access is on page 337. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. Thank you. 